very much. Um, before I start, I would like to thank the organizing committee very much for the invitation to come here. It's my second time to Serbia, and after my first visit, I said yes immediately, and I, I really appreciate the hospitality you've shown so far. For um, my plenary lecture, I thought it would be good to ask some provocative questions, and that's why I've chosen the theme of uh, evolutionary consequences of hunting. And I think this is a theme that we will be hearing more and more about as uh, wildlife managers in the future, and I think it's um, something we should be thinking about in that respect. My uh, colleagues, Andreas Cedrosir and Richard Bischoff, are uh, uh, two colleagues that have worked a lot on this topic with me. Okay. So just uh, quickly, the bear management in Sweden has been based on our Scandinavian brown bear research project. During the last 30 years, we work very closely with the managers. We have two study areas, one in the north, uh, part of, of the population's range in Sweden, and one in the south. And we capture our bears from helicopters and work mostly with females, some with males, but the goal is to follow females from their born until they die. And we do that by following quite a large number of bears with radio uh, telemetry, most years between 80 uh, to 120 bears, and in recent years, mostly with uh, GPS technology. And this, one of the things we get this is from pedigrees, uh, that are important when we're calculating heredit her heritability of uh, traits. And of course, we're studying a hunted population, so it's rather unusual for life uh, history studies, but of course, it's very important for the managers. And we also get all of the information that we want from these hunter-killed bears. Now, we've designed and, and tested a method to uh, estimate population size based on DNA from scats collected by hunters. So each area of Sweden is, is uh, um, a census in this way every five to 10 years. Now, so far, we've uh, collected over 11,000 scats. And here you can see the density of, um, of the scats that are collected it mirrors very closely the density of the bear population. We've also designed and tested a method to follow annual trends. And this is based on uh, the moose hunters, which are very well organized in Sweden. For the first week of the moose season, they report how many bear observations they have and how many hunter hours they were afield. And from that, we've, we've tested these observations per 1,000 uh, hunter hours, and it correlates very well with our population estimates. Although you can see some areas with very open forest have a different line than the other areas. So within one area, it seems to work very well. So the Organization of my talk is first, I'm going to show you some of the effects of uh, wildlife, of hu the hunting harvest on the bear population trends. So, this is not about anything about evolution, but just um, how well the size of the population has been managed. Then, I'm going to talk about the pen uh, potential effects that hunting might have on body growth and age of first reproduction, potential effects on reproductive investment by females, whether harvest is affecting the relationship between body size and lifetime reproductive success, and whether some regulations can uh, cause an evolutionary change, such as protecting females with cubs, which is done in Sweden. 
So just a bit about the demography. We found that there's a very weak selection for age and sex by hunters in Sweden and a very weak effect of the method of hunting. And this surprised us, actually. We could also see that when there was a, a large increase in the hunting quotas, we see a corresponding increase in the uh, mortality due to hunting. And that tells us that most of the hunting mortality is additive mortality to other factors. Here, the red, you see the hunter mortality. This is the hunting season. The green is natural mortality. And the gray is total mortality. We've also calculated that our population can sustain a hunting uh, harvest level of about 10%. So I'm just going to go through the what has happened with the bear management and numbers in the last 100 years. Harvest is in green, or I mean in blue, and population size is in red. And the reason that I have it population size 10 times more than the harvest, so if you see the harvest and population size are similar, you'll know that's close to stable levels. So Sweden uh, tried to exterminate their bears for hundreds of years, and then at the end of the 1800s, they changed the policy and decided to save the bear. And they had several uh, methods of protection early on. And in 1930, there may be as few as 130 bears in Sweden. Then, I'm sorry these jump around, but I had some problems just this morning <laughs> with this. In um, 1943, they started with uh, a short hunting season in the autumn. And all of the hunting in Sweden on bears is done in the fall, in the autumn season, in two areas. And during this time, the population seemed to uh, increase very slowly. And we think this slow growth was due to the relatively high harvest rate, about 10% in this period. Now, the stars will show the uh, estimates with modern methods. But in 1981, they started with a quota on how many bears could be killed. And in 1994, we first estimated there were 700 bears, but there was really probably closer to 1,000 bears. But the important thing is we documented that population was growing by 16% per year, the highest ever recorded for brown bears at that time which means the population would double every five years. So we told the managers that it's very important. If you want, should increase the quotas if you don't want the bear population to grow so fast. They did increase the quotas, but very slowly. And as we predicted, the population doubled in six years. And then it increased by um, another 1,100 bears in the next eight years. So we believe that this was due to the very low harvest levels. Now the harvest levels have in, been increased because when the population of bears in Sweden uh, got to be um, over 3,000, we could document that more people are becoming afraid of bears and there was negative uh, social reaction. And now, actually, the population is being reduced due to this high hunting level. So as a professor, I should remind you a little bit about evolution, uh, the tenets of evolution here before we go into the evolutionary part. But of course, there's individual variation in all populations. And every population is producing an excess of offspring. And not all of these will survive and reproduce. And some will have characteristics that make them survive and reproduce better than others. And if these characteristics are inherited, of course, they will be passed on to the next generation. And this will uh, lead to adaptation involving changing in uh, gene frequencies. 
And that is evolution and what we'll be talking about today. So can hunting have some undesirable evolutionary consequences? This has been very well documented in fish populations, particularly in marine fishes. But also a recent study on bighorn sheep has found that, that the trophy hunters are interested in males with very big horns, and the males with big horns have higher reproductive value, and they see that this heavy selective hunting causes a decline in horn size, body size, which are both correlated with uh, breeding value. And what they're doing is they're killing the males with high breeding value first because their horns get uh, big fast. So if you have a high selection pressure on a trophy value like this, a trait, you can um, cause evolution or selection, human-induced selection. But as I told you, the hunters in Sweden are really not selecting for any traits that we can see. So is this really relevant? And some work on red deer has shown that it, it still can be relevant because harvest-induced mortality may force these red deer to breed earlier at a, a size and an age younger than they would do otherwise, because if they don't, they will die before they are allowed to reproduce. So that's what we're wondering. Is this happening in bears? And we participated in a study of almost uh, 5,000 bear years of adult female bears in 20 populations. And you can see a huge difference between the age structure of hunted bear populations and the natural age structure. So the females have a very much shorter life expectancy. That's what we were finding in Sweden also. So are the females then behaving differently because of this short life uh, span? Well, we've compared four populations in North America with a very short period of uh, hunting selection, uh, and in uh, three populations in Europe, which of course have had a very long period of uh, persecution. And they reach size, uh, adult size at about the same age. But the North American populations reach adult mass much later. And if you look at the age of first reproduction, it's at about 90 percent of uh, when they're reaching 90% uh, of their adult mass, that's very typical for mammal populations. So what happens in Europe? Based on the red deer work, you would expect that they would start their first breeding later, I mean earlier, and that is exactly what they're doing. So we looked at this another way. We compared a great number of populations, and we looked at the, I'm sorry, the mean uh, body mass of females and litter size to look at reproductive investment. We also looked at climatic variables and density effects and, and whether there was one or two species of bears. The only thing that came out significant was whether it was these North American and Asian populations of um, low, short period of of hunting or the European populations. So these European females are investing much more reproduction at a smaller body size. Well, we're going to look a little, little bit more at body size and lifetime reproductive success of females. And what we find is that this lifetime fitness, number of young produced in a lifetime, significantly influence by the brown bear's size as a yearling and age at death. Of course, age at death is very important because, or it's natural, the longer you live, the more you can reproduce. We did early in our study with low population densities and low harvest, we had some small females that did produce well. 
But in most studies, you expect that the big individuals not only reproduce more, but they also live longer. That's not the case in our bears, because the hunters are killing them, and how long they live only depends on when they're killed by a hunter. So we can look at this, you know, looking at the, estimate the individual's contribution to population growth. There's a complicated formula here, but the point is, is it includes both survival and fec fecundity or reproduction. And um, George Orwell said all animals are equal. Actually, they're not equal. Um, there's only a few animals each year that are really contributing to population growth. And in life history theory, we know body size is very, very important. And we've, um, in survival and reproduction, and we've found that for both males that uh, produce more and also females. So, but survival is also important, right? If you look at soy sheep, which are not harvested, uh, they're sheep on an island off the coast of uh, Scotland, you can see that here's males. The bigger they are, the more they can contribute to population growth. Females, same way, very clear trend. Our brown bears in Scandinavia, there's no relationship at all. It looks like we think, anyway, that the hunting that we're doing that is affecting survival enough that we actually are decoupling this natural expected relationship between body size and survival. So we, um, in Sweden, have a, a system that is actually found in most countries that hunt bears that for ethical reasons and to uh, to protect females and also the young, these family groups are protected from hunting. So we wondered, well, can that have any consequences for selection? And we found that the small mothers have small yearlings because what we see is that some bears, mothers, they keep their young for one and a half years and some keep for two and a half years. So we're wondering why, why is this different? And it turns out that the females with small yearlings, they have a higher probability to, to keep them longer. So then the young survive better, but of course the mother's uh, life reproductive success is less because she has fewer um, litters. And because almost all the mortality of adult females is due to hunting, we could show that these females, they have a lower survival rate when they're going with cubs because they're protected. And we don't know if they're heritable, but if yearling size or litter interval is heritable, which we expect it will be, body size usually is, there we could be selecting for females of a lower reproductive uh, ability just by protecting them, because they're protected more than the productive females who um, get rid of their young after one and a half years, and then they're exposed to hunting during the hunting season. So they're exposed to more hunting seasons. So really, we could actually be selecting for less productive females. So my summary is that uh, effects of hunting and population trends really shows a, a success story in S Sweden. It's quite obvious that the managers can set the population level at any goal they have just uh, through the hunting quotas. But I would like to uh, bring up the possibility that through this hunting, we could be affecting body growth, age of first reproduction, the reproductive investment of these bears, uh, the relationship between the body size and lifetime reproductive success through our effects on survival. And maybe some of the regulations are also causing selective 
uh, selection in the population. And so I'm not at all criticizing hunting or saying that we shouldn't hunt them because we have to hunt them to keep them within these goals that we have. But I'm just saying we should think about these possibilities. So, hvala na nasnih.